Good morning, good evening, or middle of the night, whatever time it happens to be for you today. Today is about as close to getting into real patent law as any of these sessions, except for the next, the next two, are, are going to be. We've been focusing up to now much more on the, okay, what are the economics? What do you look for? What can IP do or not do for you? And sessions five, six, and seven will focus more on, okay, now we have a patent, what do we do with it? But today we're getting down to some of the basics. A patent lawyer would want to know them and would talk to you about them until you're so sick of listening you don't know what to say. My goal today is that you understand enough of these basics because frankly they bound what type of patent you're likely to get and they present some fuzzy boundaries on what type of patent you're not. And both of those are really critical to your business planning. I think I closed off last time by talking about what the patent or the patent office will think is not important. And let me just very quickly, there are two things that the patent office really won't care about. The first is whether what your patent describes infringes anything else. That's of course critical to your business, but not to the patent office. And the second is what might infringe your patent what particular products. Patent office doesn't care about that either. Its only job is deciding whether or not it should give you a patent. And it looks really at four different things. Are you trying to patent the kind of thing that's patentable? Are you trying to patent something that's new? And those are the two we're going to deal with today. The other two are is what you're doing non-obvious? Is it what everybody who isn't a patent lawyer thinks of as, is it an invention? And last but not least, and this is really a job for your patent attorney eventually, did somebody write a decent patent, a decent application, and decent claims? Because there's some specifics that those have to deal with. So let's start off with patentable subject matter. This is section 101 of the statute. You'll notice that there are four categories, and I've inserted them in Romans. We'll get to those in a couple of minutes. Let's pause for a second, though, on the first line, that whatever you're doing to make it patentable, it has to be new and it has to be useful. What does new mean? It means that there's no single piece of prior art, no paper, no product, no pr chemical process that uses or discloses exactly what you're now claiming. If it's only close, that turns into obviousness, and that's next week, that's section 103. Section 102, that we'll turn to about halfway through, defines what are the types of prior art, what types of things do you look at to decide <clears throat> whether something is new, at least if it's important to you. Useful is very rarely an issue. It requires that it works. Perpetual motion machines don't count. 150 years ago, people trying to patent airplanes were not able to do so successfully. In this country, useful doesn't mean anything has to be any better. Old German law, it did have to be. The only thing useful really comes down to now is things have to advance to a stage where you know you could do something with it other than simply continuing to conduct more research. But a 90% of the stuff you deal with, maybe 99% of the stuff you deal with, that is probably not going to be an issue. The four categories, machine, manufacture, composition of matter, and process. The quotes here are all from Supreme Court cases, U.S. Supreme Court, that had to define, okay, what do we mean by these terms? Because they've been around for many, many years. What I think you need to note about them right now is all of these talk about physical, tangible things. 
This is all hard. These are things that if you can't pick them up in your hand, you can at least watch them happening in a Petri dish or heaven knows where else. You can watch them happening in a manufacturing plant. System has been around a long time. Computers came in and they started to change things a little. Just look for a moment at a machine. A machine is a machine, but it may have a new computer program in it. A process for making tires or anything else, they've been doing this since Goodyear. But you may want to introduce some computer controls into it. How do we work computers into particularly machines and processes? And that is an ongoing problem. Four categories include the vast majority of inventions that you'll ever run into and probably be involved in. They don't include everything. The court made a statement, Supreme Court again, that Congress intended anything under the sun made by man. Not quite accurate. And as a matter of fact, they knew it. They misquoted part of the congressional record to come up with that. And it's very clear, if you get to a couple of their cases, that there are exclusions. You can't get a patent on a law of nature, a physical phenomena, or an abstract idea. You can't get a patent that, in effect, would patent a basic idea as contrasted with, OK, how do I do it? And this came to a head in the Supreme Court after a lot of years of really slipping into the abyss. In about four cases decided between 2010 and 2014. Two of them were directed to what you might call a business idea. How do I hedge prices so I don't lose money if the energy price of gas goes too much up or too much down? How do I reduce settlement risk by having, if I don't trust the person I'm dealing with? That's Bielski and Alice. What do you do with a patent that's directed to the proper dose of a drug? What do you do with a patent that's directed to an isolated gene? Well, the Supreme Court held that all four of those patents were invalid. The first two, because this basic economic idea, this how do I run my business idea, was pretty abstract until how you got into, OK, exactly how do I do this? And they found that the how do I do it was child's play. The second two, because the core was really something that all had long existed in nature, you discovered it, but once you discovered it, what else? There are similar exclusions in most other countries. I've just put some up here on the list. Important thing to note is none of these exclusions have to be. They're all based on policy decisions. They're based on decisions that are made in a country of what do we think we should give patents for and what should we not give patents for if we're going to advance what we as a country want to advance. India, for example, is very, very concerned with the fact that it has a very large poor population, it living very badly, and they want to improve their way of life. That is less of a concern here, it's less of a concern in Europe. The list is also somewhat oversimplified, and frankly, these are pulled out of the statutes in most cases. And they're too, uh, they're not as broad as they look. Let's take Europe, for example. Program for a computer, so saith the EU, is not patentable. But a program that is used in an industrial process is. Something that exists in nature per se is not patentable. But if you discover it has a technical effect in Europe, they will let you patent it. And you'll find similar exclusions to the exclusions if you go into these in any detail. The bottom line, if you're looking for a patent in a major market, Get someone who really knows what the law is in that country and talk to them about what might or might not pass the test. Because they need to take it into consideration when they're writing your patent application that frankly is going to be the same application essentially filed in every country. 
you can't forget about different parts of the world and different exclusions when you start putting that patent application together. You probably also notice there's some common themes here, the things that create, frankly, problems. Mathematical methods or algorithms, discovery of something that already existed in nature, like your DNA, something you can do in your head or just using a pencil and paper, and a computer program that often is a substitute, but a heck of a lot faster, for something you can do in your head. In most countries, these are laid out, as I mentioned, by statute. In the U.S., they're not. You have the basic statement we looked at a few minutes ago. You have the court-created exclusions, but they're all court-created policy. And the big question that has to be faced, not only in the U.S., but frankly also when you get into any foreign country, is when does an invention that involves something that at least at some level, no, we decided we're not going to give you a patent on this, becomes something that is patentable. What is not excluded? Well, these are three fairly old cases. They all effectively predated computers. There may have been some pretty rudimentary ones around by 39, 1939, but not a heck of a lot. These fit, you'll note, fairly nicely with the four hard categories, machines, processes, compositions of matter. And they also put forth a basic idea that long predates computers. You can't patent a simple idea or principle in and of itself. You have to apply it in some useful way. Once you have done so, at least your application of that idea, that application of that discovery, is patentable. One question you're going to have to answer, and unfortunately the law at this stage does not answer it, is when I'm deciding whether or not to give you a patent, do I look only to the application to decide if it's an invention, or do I look to the basic idea or the thing that already existed, take a gene, and give you credit for having discovered that also, even though I've said I won't give you a patent on it? It's an open question, and it makes a major difference on what type of patent you might grant. The first th thing that they talked about in the Supreme Court decisions is you cannot patent an abstract idea. Why not? Well, let's give you an easy example. Jules Verne at least had the idea of let's go to the moon. Were you going to give Jules Verne a patent on his idea because basically use his book as a uh, patent application? Not simply on getting to the moon because he thought he had some ways to do it. They were probably a little short of being successful. But did you really want to have the first person who thinks it would be fun to go to the moon be the only person who can have a patent on how in heaven's name do I get to the moon? And you have the same problem when you get into patents that are based on things that naturally occur. Genes are one example because those the Supreme Court looked at. What's the proper level of something in your blood, your urine, some other metal type of testing? Does the first person who discovers that a gene is a marker for breast cancer get a patent on that gene and the fact that it's a marker? Or is that too broad as a policy matter to permit one person, one company, to lock it up? This churned through the Supreme Court and through more patent lawyer discussions than you ever want to listen to for a number of years. The most recent approach was in Alice v. CLS Bank in 2014. And it established a two-step analysis to go through to decide if something you claimed was what they call patent eligible. Their first step 
was this thing directed to a law of nature, a natural phenomenon, or an abstract idea? That requires some definitional work. What is an abstract idea? What is a natural phenomenon? What is a law of nature? And what does directed to mean? Does it mean it simply claims it? Or does it mean that it really springs off it and it's really the basis? The second step, according to the Supreme Court, was does the claim include an inventive concept to transform something that's not patentable into something that is? What is an inventive concept? I'm pausing because there's a fair amount of fight about that and lack of understanding at the moment. The courts and the patent office have been struggling what these require. It's fairly easy to decide what a law of nature is, what level of a chemical should be in your blood, what, what is a gene in your body. There's no common understanding of what blazes an abstract idea, and there's no clear understanding of what's meant by an inventive step. The result, unhappily for you, less unhappily for a lot of patent lawyers because it's a sure source of a lot of ongoing business, the decided cases are all over the map. The outcome in any case is highly fact dependent. When you get to the Federal Circuit, it may even depend on which group of judges, which three judges out of something over around 18 do you draw because they have different views. If you're in the patent office, they have a manual of patent examining procedure that's, oh, it's probably about four inches thick, and you can find it online if you're really tr having trouble sleeping, and you will find in it probably hundreds of different examples. And what it basically tells you, Mr. Examiner, Mrs. Examiner, if you're looking at this, is, oh, go look at these examples and make up your mind. There is not much real guidance as a result of which the results in the patent office are at least as inconsistent when you're trying to fight your way through as they are in the courts. So let's try to think for a moment about what's an abstract idea. Some things are easy. You go back to those cases that we looked at a few minutes ago, simply the idea to do something, divorced from the how to do it, that fits in to abstract. You might not think so if you went to your dictionary, but it's clearly that the way it works in the patent world. Are they claims directed to an end result, go to the moon? Or how do you get there, ask one of the Apollos. What's an inventive concept? We'll hopefully deal with that. Second stage of abstract ideas is something you can do in your head or using a paper and pencil. Everybody's understood for years, going back to really pre or the world's earliest computers, that what you do in your head, mental steps, are not patentable for all kinds of policy reasons. And if you use a pencil and paper to help yourself out because, like me, your memory is getting old, that shouldn't make it patentable either. Fundamental economic business practices. How do you hedge against market risk? How do you reduce the risk that one of the people you're dealing with is a cheat? How do you make sure that people who haven't paid for your service use it? All of those are good business ideas. They're things you really want to accomplish. But once you think of them as a business idea, how to do it in this day and age, how to accomplish it, is really pretty simple. Compute the risk one party, get a third party intermediary. Let somebody else hold all the, the whole pot in the poker game until it's over. And then they can dole out to who would really win. Fundamental economic practices, the business methods, that's not patentable. That is still abstract in and of itself. 20 years ago, the Federal Circuit decided a case called State Street Bank and Trust and they kind of upset this apple cart. They decided that pure data processing, because it produced a useful result, other data that you were interested in, was patentable. 
Supreme Court rejected that concrete, useful, tangible result. And they said, no. If you basically look at, I've got the claims here for State Street that the Federal Circuit said is good, and Alice Bank, the Supreme Court had the most recent case that said, no, this doesn't do it. And as you'll see, State Street, they're not a bad set of claims. They tell you what to do, but they're all data processing. There's nothing there but data processing. And the only thing you come up with is the aggregate at the end. There's nothing new, hard created. There's no technological advance. But the Federal Circuit at that stage said, yes, it's patentable. Alice is very much the same. This is how you protect yourself from the cheat. It's all a computer about holding data and transferring the data back and forth. It's all the same type of thing. State Street clearly wouldn't pass Alice's two-step test. Is it an abstract idea? Yes. How do you do? I want to basically keep track of profits and loss throughout the year, and I want to do it on a daily basis. Is there an inventive concept? How you do that, deciding on, once you decide to do it, it just tells you the steps that any Dom, Dick, or Harry would obviously take. So we've now got, after Eh, it's about eight years of flailing around. Three rules that you probably need to keep in mind when you're trying to make at least a rough judgment as to whether or not something you've thought about, you've decided you want to do, your company wants to do, is patentable. And the first is clearly the most important. Software is patentable. If you have a machine that makes widgets, or you have a process that makes better tires than Goodyear did, that's patentable. If that process or the machine itself is patentable, whether or not one of its components or one of the things it makes use of happens to be a computer program. People will tell you that software isn't patentable. It, it isn't true. It depends on what's done with it. The last two case bullets come out of a Federal Circuit case where after struggling for six or so years, they sorted out another fairly basic concept that when you think about it, at least seems to make sense. If what you've done with your software is make the computer better, that's the type of thing we want to give you, or at least want to think about giving you a patent on. If, on the other hand, all you're doing is using an existing general process and unit to do a function that is the buzzwords are now well understood, routine and conventional, previously known to the industry, that's not. Those probably should guide, I guess, a very large percentage of you that are going to be making great use of software going forward to at least what some of the boundaries are. There's no clear answer as you get closer and closer what's the difference between functionality and what's more, what is or is not routine and conventional. But it does set a few stakes in the ground that you can keep in mind. So let's change a little and go look at the other th part of what the Supreme Court says you can't get a patent on. Nature's secrets. These are a little different. There's still no decent definition of what's a law or nature or a natural phenomenon, but there probably is a much better common understanding. Unlike abstract ideas, they're not abstract. They're concrete and they have specific qualities. And even if somebody, nobody really knew had all the information about what level of something should be in your blood or what gene marks for breast cancer, the fact that nature had established knew. So overall, at that level, there's nothing new about these laws of nature as a phenomenon. 
The e equal mc square and law of gravity, those show up in about 80% of the Supreme Court cases because at least the scientific background of most of the justices, they've heard it. And let me be fair for a moment. I think the Supreme Court basically gets a lot of these cases right. They don't use the words that patent lawyers would use, but as stepping back and understanding broader policy, they do a pretty good job on that. The problem is straightening out some of the verbiage and concepts that may get mixed up. Federal Circuit is probably worth taking a minor step back here, at least to one side. You notice a lot of these cases were out of what's called the Federal Circuit. In this country, your all patent cases go to the United States courts as opposed to district courts. And we have three levels of courts. We have district courts that exist in every state, and many states have been divided into multiple districts. We have courts of appeal, I think 12 or 13 of them, that hear appeals from the district courts in groups of states. And at the top, you have the Supreme Court. Prior to 1982, all patent cases went to the normal numbered Court of Appeals. If you sued somebody in Massachusetts, the appeal went to the First Circuit that sits in Boston. If you sued somebody in Chicago, it went to the Seventh Circuit that sits there. If you sued somebody on the West Coast, it probably went to the Ninth Circuit in San Francisco. Needless to say, the circuit decisions, since there were a lot of circuits dealing with the issues, were not entirely consistent and the idea grew that they were too anti-patent. So in 1982, Congress established the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals. It now hears all patent cases from all district courts and from the patent office. You didn't like the result there. It viewed its job to as to strengthen the patent system. To a much greater extent than the Supreme Court, it seems to view its job as making sure that anyone who deserves a patent gets one. Supreme Court kind of looks more at the other side of the coin and says it's important that people who shouldn't get patents don't because of the effect on competition. And the penumbra between those two is where most of the fighting is. Okay, let's get back to nature's secrets. It can be really expensive and time consuming to discover some of these. Ask your bio companies. But once you've discovered the secret, applying or using it may be relatively simple. All the background science is there. Isolating a gene, we'll get to a minute. It was very difficult to isolate a gene back in 1980. In 2018, it's done at the bench by any postdoc almost on a regular basis. But there's a really important underlying policy question. If making that underlying discovery that may be very important takes an awful lot of time and an awful lot of money, and as you get into it, there's absolutely no guarantee that you're going to be successful, how does the system provide the incentive for the bio and research companies to do it? If you don't give them patents, will they do the research? Will the public get the benefits of that research? I don't pretend to have the answer to how that should be sorted out, but I think it's very much at the center of the thinking, particularly in the nature's secrets in the patent area. And it's going back and forth, and how is it going to be resolved? 20 years ago, everybody said, oh, if I isolate something that exists in nature and I use it because it's great in medicine, it's patentable. Four cases up there, adrenaline, purified vitamins, EPO, which is why Amgen is a billion dollar company today, LabCorp, metabolite. Somebody's got too much amino acid in your blood, don't give them as much. But there's an underlying principle here. What do you do with what the Supreme Court said back in 48, and it said the other thing, same thing really a couple, at least once or twice since. If you're gonna find invention, and in 48 they just, they're talking about patentable invention, the present statute didn't quite exist yet. 
you have to, it's to come from how you apply that naturally occurring thing to a new and useful end. Did those first four cases up above take that into consideration? Should they have? And if they didn't, what result did it make? It made a big difference to have those patentable, the companies that came up with the patents. Was there a negative effect on potential competition and broad, broad widespread use of the discovery of those underlying natural secrets? In 1913, 2013 and 2012, the Supreme Court went back to funk. It was fairly clear, simple example. A new mineral discovered in the earth, a new plant in the wild, they didn't say genes at this age, are not patentable. And the, next you get the two, these are the two cases, Mayo and Myriad, that are based on discoveries of things in nature. Mayo discovered how much of a metabolite you wanted in your blood. This patent said, increase or decrease it so it's in the right range. Once you know what the level is, not difficult. This is simply an application of the desired law of nature. Once you know that metabolite level you're shooting for, eh, the rest of it's routine. Same thing on Myriad, who decide, found the location and sequence of the BRCA gene. They claimed the isolated gene. Supreme Court said, no, the naturally occurring DNA is a product of nature and merely isolation, at least at that stage of history, wasn't enough to bring it within the scope of patentable subject matter. Where are these cases going to live? Where are they going to lead? Who knows? Federal Circuit clearly doesn't like it. It really understands that these cases are a damper on research and, and that really we want to have done. These three cases up here, 1916, somebody discovered that you can find the DNA in a fetus in a mother's blood. Not patent eligible, straight following of the Mayo rule. Same year, three different judges in the Federal Circuit, said if you discovered that some thing, hepocytes, and somebody can tell me exactly what they are, they can survive multiple freeze-thaw cycles, why isn't that a law of nature? Each of the method steps, freezing, thawing, and separating, was old. But this three-judge panel said, oh no, myriad doesn't control, and it's patentable. And more recently, you've got a third panel that's split two to one, on something very much the same, very, very close to treating for how much is in your blood, two to one said it's not patentable, excuse me, said it was, but the judge who wrote the case just above said it wasn't. You figure it out. And you're going to have to, your company is going to have to, if you're in this industry, to decide how to get the return on something and frankly, whether to spend the money to go into that type of research. LabCorp on the left here and Mayo on the right are the two cases I'm basically just treating so there's the right amount of X somewhere in your blood. LabCorp, detect this ain't enough, assay it, for, and correlate it and do something. Mayo is the same thing, determine the level and increase it if you're supposed to. Distinction between these two, eight years and a Supreme Court that looked at it rather than a Federal Circuit that looked at it under it's important to prevent, protect the inventor, where the Supreme Court was more interested in protecting the broader society. A couple of last thoughts on exclusion. Whether something is patent eligible is only the first step. About a month ago, the director of the patent office gave a speech that was fairly widely reported to patent lawyers, at least, I doubt any of you bothered to read it, in which he was bemoaning kind of the mess the patent office is in trying to sort all this out. But he did reemphasize that just deciding that this is the type of thing that you might be able to get a patent on is not the end step. It's also got to be new. It's also got to be non-obvious. 
Myriad, interestingly enough, cDNA, as I've learned over the years, does not exist in nature. You make it from the native DNA. Well, if it doesn't exist in nature, is it eligible for a patent? Supreme Court said it was. But they left open, since they didn't have a record, whether cDNA claims would be patentable, i.e., would they satisfy 102 and 103? And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, in determining new or obvious, what's the prior art? And the patent also has to meet the 112 requirements. You've got to have a decent specification that tells you what in blazes in the invention and how do I use it. And you need claims, and we'll get in both of these next session around, that point out and hopefully so somebody can understand them, say what in heaven's name is the protected invention. The other thought, just to leave you with, is as you would expect, this is an uncertainty in this area, leads to all kinds of people trying to figure out is how are we going to resolve the problem? Well, the IPO, the Intellectual Properties Owners Association, businesses that really like patents, and the AIPLA, the American Association of Patent Lawyers, which also tends to like patents, want to amend the statute. I'll go through very quickly. A looks familiar, but you'll notice something's missing. The word new. The old one read new and useful process. New is now missing. They also say if it's ineligible if and only the entire claim, what is claimed, exists in nature independently or is performed, not even can be performed, in the human mind. Ask yourself the question that if this had been the statute in all of the cases that we're talking about, frankly, going all the way back to the 1850s and 1930s, would the results have been the same? I think clearly not. And the question, the balancing question, that if this ever gets to Congress is going to have to be decided there, and believe me, the lobby on each side will be intense, is going to come down to how do we come up with a policy that draws intelligent lines for the country between what can you patent, what is too abstract, and what frankly already existed, how broad a claim are we going to give you because you discovered something that's been there forever. And you just come back 20 years, 30 years, and maybe we'll find out. So let's turn the page really this time. We're going to move on to prior art. There are now two patent laws in effect. 1952 Act that came about then covers patents, applications, and more than that, patents on app that issued as a result of an application that was filed before March of 2013. Those applications or patents all will have a life probably of 20 years from when, 17 years from when they issue. The new act covers applications that were filed after that date. They'll cover things that basically will deal, or for, they'll be effective for 20 years, but from the date of filing. In thinking about what you're facing, you're going to have to deal with both of them for another 20 years. For your new ideas, you're going to deal with the AIA. But when somebody shows up at your front door and says, stop what you're doing based on an old patent, or you go rummaging through your files and you come up with an old patent that you think you might sue somebody on and advance your business, you're going to have to worry about the earlier one. What are the differences? Principally, they affect what's prior art. They mainly affect it because we now grant patents of the first to file an application 
not to the first of invent. We've broadened prior art to include activity abroad. It used only to be printed stuff. And we've mucked around with the, had been the one year grace period that said once you made your invention, yeah, you didn't have to file for a year because it probably didn't make much difference. And there's one other thing that these did that didn't really make the slide is they did a lot to increase the ways in which somebody who felt threatened by a patent could go back to the patent office and say, you guys made a mistake. Take another look at this because this patent, at least as it's written, the claims are written, never should have issued. A little of that was in the 52 Act. There's a lot more of it in the AIA. And again, this is a subject we'll deal with in a little more detail when we get to the, okay, after your patent is issued. Prior art, new, as of when? Well, one of the things in 52, there were two important dates, a year before you filed your application, as I just mentioned, and when you made your invention. What do we mean by making the invention? It means actually doing it, usually. You actually built something, you tested something, you ran a process. There was also what was called, and that was called a re reduction to practice. Not a bad choice of word. It was also what was called a constructive reduction to practice, which was filing a patent application, because if the system didn't somehow recognize that you weren't required, actually, it does recognize you don't have to do anything before you file. But if somebody hasn't actually made it before he files, how do we deal with successive patents if all you have is applications? So you have to treat the first one that's filed as constructively making the invention, at least if it's a decent enough application. That section is now gone. Also gone with it are a lot of issues that a lot of us spent a lot of time over the many years worrying about. That got rid of because we now care who was first to file, not who was first to invent. We also, under the NIAA, the only important date is effective filing date. That is, in many ways, very similar to when the application was filed under the old law, but it's the only date that matters now. And as I mentioned, it also resulted in some changes to prior art. These are the two prior art sections under the new and the old law. The old law is on the right. Going to the first section, patented or publication was in this or a foreign country. Public use was in this country. Both of those are gone. They're not in the present law, the A1, on the left. More than a year before the date of the application is gone. What substituted is the effective filing date. Before the invention was made, in D is gone. Again, what's left is effective filing date. Those are the basic changes to the prior art that was made by the 52 Act. If you're looking for a new patent, or excuse me, made by the AIA, if you're looking for a patent now, look at the one on the left. If you have to deal with an older one, look at the one on the right. Effective filing date, as I mentioned, date the application was filed. It's important under both laws. Why? A very simple reason. Only something before the effective filing date can be prior art. We can't really look at stuff after you've, effect you've filed your application or what's the use of filing. What is the effective filing date? In many cases, it's the date the US application was actually filed. For those of you who are abroad, it probably will be the date of the application you filed in France or Germany or Japan or China or India with one proviso that you're entitled to claim priority to that application in the US. What do we mean by claiming a priority? 
What we basically mean is the law says, or in, if the application you filed ab abroad was good enough to pass muster in the U.S., and you filed in the U.S. within a year of the time you filed abroad, we'll treat your foreign application as though it had been filed in the U.S. If it's not a good enough application or there's a break in a chain, you don't get priority. But usually, you do. Query whether effective filing date is really exactly the same as under the prior law. I don't know of any decisions that have addressed this yet. Under the 52 Act, the usual test whether your application was good enough, whether you were entitled to claim priority, was that the earlier application disclose what you're now trying to claim. The AIA loved definitions, so it put in a lot of them. And it says, it said, remember, claimed invention. Well, the claimed invention is defined by a claim. The effective filing date is the date on when an application containing such a claim was filed. There are a lot of chains of applications in which the claims in the earlier application are very, very different from the ones in the later one. So even if the earliest one, which may date back a lot of years, fully disclosed what you're now trying to claim, if you didn't claim it early enough, are you entitled to priority? Nobody knows. There's been a lot of talk, largely some patent lawyers, but also in industry, because it's an important thought. After, do I have any grace on this? Do I really have to walk in and file this application right away? Or can I spend some time trying to figure out whether it's worthwhile? Under the 52 Act, once you'd made your invention, what you had done, anything you did with it, whether you disclosed it, whether you sold product, whether you tried to sell product, whether you use it, wasn't prior art to you unless you'd done it more than a year before you finally got around to filing the patent application. Things that a third party did in that year weren't prior art to you either if you'd made the invention. The AIA changed the rules. Now if it happened before the application was, your application was filed, the section we looked at before said, that's prior art. That was before the effective filing date. But Congress was not willing to throw away the idea that a U.S. inventor wanted to be able, to, particularly an individual inventor, to figure out whether it was worth spending the money. How good was it? Would it sell? So they did two things, two exceptions. And they said if you made a disclosure less than a year, or a year or less, before you finally filed your patent application, that disclosure isn't prior art if you made it, excuse me, this is somebody else's disclosure. Let me straighten this out. Somebody else's disclosure made before it won't be, is not prior art. If the disclosure was made by somebody who learned the idea from you. That's fairly that's straightforward. That's simple. That's easy to understand. And frankly, it makes all kinds of sense. But then there's a broader one, that if the subject matter of what the inventor disclosed had been publicly disclosed earlier, that's an absolute bar on prior art by third parties who may have come up with theirs completely independently. This is not the world's simplest section. It has not been interpreted much, but it clearly sets up two different rules that would help U.S. inventors be able to do something in relative safety in the U.S. before they spend money on patent applications. But of course, there's a footnote. This year of grace exists only in the U.S. This encourages public disclosure in the U.S. But what do you do about the simple fact that if I disclose something in Cambridge, 
it's going to bar patents everywhere outside the United States because there is no year of grace. And public disclosure outside, in a country outside the U.S., in almost all circumstances, bars a patent. Be careful. <laughs> it looks good if all you care about is the U.S. market. It can be no good at all and very deadly if you're interested in markets abroad. Okay, what's the prior art? Well, the five categories we looked at a few minutes ago have been around for a long time. Patented, described in a printed publication, public use, on sale, described in an earlier filed application. But there's a new one, otherwise available to the public. Nobody knows what it means. And a question when asked, I'll say in a few minutes, does that make things prior art that didn't used to be prior art? Or does it make things that used to be prior art no longer prior art? You can see it going both ways. But let's look at the basic categories. Patented. This is not as important as it used to be because this has been around probably the better part of more than 200 years, at which point a lot of patents weren't printed, especially in some countries. They were kind of patented and laid open. You'd go look at them somewhere, but it wasn't printed. So whether something was patented had to be a distinct category from printed publications. It's much, much less important now that all patents are printed. There are a few things this can add, but they're very rarely in interest. Much more important is what in heaven's name is a printed publication. That phrase was coined in about the act in about 1790. In that context, it made sense. Printed ensured that probably were multiple copies. It wasn't simply one, because it wasn't worth printing if all you had was a single copy. And publication had the sense here and in the copyright law that goes back to about the same time it was thrown out to the public. So you had a lot of copies thrown out to the public. That's a printed publication. That bars your patent. And I don't care where that took place. Congress made the policy judgment that the chances of something published somewhere else in the world, perhaps unlikely in reality, but was had a sufficient potential that they wanted to include it in prior art. Recognizing the time and technology have marched on, the Federal Circuit now uses a totality of the circumstances test. Was it disseminated? What was the public accessibility? Who were the people listening to it or potentially listening to it? That sounds great. As an idea, the circumstances can vary. But what is your patent lawyer going to tell you when you ask him, precisely what in heaven's name is a printed publication. If it depends on all of these circumstances and there is no hard rule, we've lost something. Take some examples. A thesis in, in a library. My typewritten thesis over here in the MIT library, Bachelor's thesis, is it a printed publication? Sure wasn't printed. I'll kind of guarantee it's the only copy still in existence because I can't find mine. But under the present law, if that is indexed by subject matter, it qualifies. What about a report that you send out only internally to a group within MIT or maybe the research people who funded the grant? Is that a printed publication? Well, it depends. It doesn't do you much good either. Was it expected to be confidential? How big was the distribution? You go to a technical meeting. You present a paper. You've been waiting for this opportunity for years to get your name up in lights. So you present a paper and everybody stands up and cheers at the end. Is what you told them qualify as a printed publication? If you handed out an abstract, does that change it? Or suppose you had a poster board up for three days. 
In this one case, it said it's a printed publication because you had a poster board up. And there's an MIT case that said it's a printed publication because there were perhaps a dozen handouts to a thousand people at a meeting that was otherwise all oral. Stuff on the internet. That is now pretty well accepted as, a, as printed publication because it's widely accessible to anybody who can find it and most search engines are getting better. What do you do when it disappears? Question not answered. You want money from NIH or DARPA. You write them a proposal. Is that printed publication? That's going to depend on the confidentiality rules. Is it or is it not? Don't the old song, it ain't necessarily so, either way. Public use is the other major category, actually, and on sale, that show up in both the older and the new act. The thing to note about public use is it can be public use and be pretty darn limited. Prior use and knowledge by a single person who wasn't under conditions of confidentiality is enough. Accessible to the public, in this case, it's actually one who found that it wasn't because it was buried in a safe and nobody even knew it was there. Use by a single person under no limitation or obligation of secrecy. This is probably one of the more fun cases in patent law. This was an invention by a man of a new and improved corset stay. And he gave a set of the stays to his then fiance, who quite naturally used them because they were better. He didn't tell her she had to keep them confidential. On the other hand, it's quite unlikely that she went out and flashed them around in public. But because she could have, the Supreme Court said, that is a public use. And 60 years after that, there was another case that reached the Supreme Court and involved the question of a company was using a machine to produce batteries. And it did so in its usual plant. It had the usual type of security check in and out. But beyond that, it didn't treat this machine as really one of its key jewels. The guards at the gate were probably more to prevent people from taking stuff out than bringing stuff in. And the Supreme Court established the rule that the ordinary use of a machine, obviously not saying so, but absent real confidentiality provision, is also a public use. How does that tie in to what type of use is necessary to blow a trade secret? Clearly, there are levels of confidentiality that will or will not prevent something from being public. On sale, the other big category. First thing to remember, if I sell you my patent, that does not put the invention on sale. The on sale, you can sell sale of rights, the mortgaging of rights. Pledging rights is an interest. Does not, if you pledge the pieces, the products, or you sell them, it's different. But simply selling intellectual property rights doesn't put those invention on sale. Other thing, on sale does not require that anything actually have been sold. A commercial offer to sell is enough. And that's, <sighs> Supreme Court looked at this. It went to the universal, uniform commercial code that governs most sales in the U.S. Remember now on sale is anywhere in the world. I have no idea what the rules are for a commercial sale in most other countries of the world, and I'll guarantee that the Supreme Court doesn't either. But it has to be something more than something that's really informal. How much more? Good question. If basically you've got an offer that's ready to be accepted, and this is where it comes down to, if you offer to sell something and all the terms are there, quantity, price, time of delivery, et cetera, that's a commercial offer. What are you selling? Are you selling vaporware? Lots of software companies do. They're sure they can do it, but they're damned they're going to spend the money to do it until somebody is sure they're going to buy it. Pure vaporware, probably not. 
because under a Supreme Court case that came up with the commercial offer and also this one requires the invention to be sale, an offer for sale of something that's ready for patenting. Now there's a phrase that turns a patent lawyer's heart. What does it mean? Probably means nothing more than you've gotten it far enough that you've either proved it'll work so you can get it ready for patent, or you've written up a good enough description, even if you've never done a darn thing, so your patent attorney can now write an application. But it has to go beyond the basic idea. It has to have some progress either to a thing or to a description of how that result might be achieved. There is an exception to both this sale and use. It's basically, the first one's experimental. If you are a small company or what you're doing requires a lot of space, you may not be able to test out your product or your process within your concertina wire fences. We wanted, the system wanted to give you the ability to test something to see if it would work. Not to see if people would buy it, but to see if it would work. And they let you do so. The classic case here came out of Boston. Is somebody built a corduroy, which is making make out of logs road, leading out of Boston sometime in the early 1800s. And you have this metal picture as you read the case with the inventor coming out there with his cane on a daily basis and tapping the logs to see how they were doing. All this time, a lot of people were going over that road. That's what he wanted to have happen. That was found to be an experimental use because he was ex the inventor was experimenting to see whether this thing would work. Once you've determined it does work, experimentation comes to an end. The other thing, and take this road, it was experimental so the inventor's clock didn't start running. Could somebody else make use of the fact that the inventor was experimenting and file his or her own patent application? Answer is no. If it's use in public, that's a public use from anybody else's point of view and as a bar, even though we give the inventor the ability to do necessary testing in public. What about secret prior art? Let's take the Coca-Cola formula. Or let's take a lot of processes that people really don't want to disclose how they make a product. And the product is one that, frankly, you can't figure out how it was made simply by back engineering or testing the product itself. Under the 52 Act and some prior acts, a secret sale or a secret use of a product a process to make a product that was commercially sold were prior art to the inventor. And they were prior art to the inventor much more in the sense that these were acts that forfeited the inventor's otherwise existing right to seek a patent than really being publicly available, which everything else in this prior art section is. 1942, maybe 42 to the early 40s, maybe the late 30s, a very well-known judge, learned hand, laid it out clearly. The inventor has to make a choice. The system cannot afford to let him run for 25 years or 50 years protecting this as a trade secret, making lots of money, and then the minute his most valued employee is about to leave, now rush out and try to patent it because he's afraid that the employee will take it with him. Choose your horse. You could have one or the other. Again, this kind of secret activity was not prior art to a third party. Which brings us to otherwise available to the public. Does it change the law? Does it change the law one way or another? Are secret uses and sales still prior art to anybody? 
Well, you see the quote here from the legislative history, and legislative history is a slight overstatement because it's one senator speaking on the floor, and my guess is maybe two more were also present. But he said that this new act meant that private offers for sale, private uses, and secret processes that resulted in a product or service that was made public would no longer be deemed patent-defeating prior use. That would knock out having to choose which horse to ride and would clearly limit the extent to which a, quote, secret sale or a secret use would be prior art at least going forward. Case related to this is now in front of the Supreme Court, and it's kind of a screwed up case because there's a lot of stuff into it, and the focus is on, okay, how much of, this, how much of what was sold was or was not known, was or was not confidential. When they decide it, we'll have some better insight into did the act really intend to change the old hand rule, or did it not? On the other side of the coin, expanding the speech I mentioned to, this paper you were presenting, this conference you went to, the presentations you made to a lot of investors, none of whom will agree to secrecy, mind you, because you wanted them to fund you or all the kinds. Pure oral has never been prior art. But if you now tell this to a group without express confidentiality, is the information prior art that is available to the public and bars you. I know nothing in the prior legislative history that tells me this. If you decide that things no longer need to make it to the stage of a printed publication, haven't you really made that section kind of irrelevant? A lot of the use is relevant. Otherwise available to the public could make some simple changes or broadly interpreted, it could swallow up a lot of the other rules that have long, long governed. When you're trying to decide whether you're entitled to a patent or somebody else is entitled to a patent, what do I have to measure against? What is the quote prior art? The last, one of the last other parts on this is what do you do about earlier filed patent applications? Recognize the problem. Patent application doesn't get published for 18 months. If you're not going to, if you only file in the U.S. and you've promised you won't file abroad, it's not going to be published at all, and nothing will become non-secret until the patent issues. Over that period of time, a lot of other people may have come up with essentially the same idea and filed their own applications. They had utterly no way to find out that you had done something and had done it first. How do we handle the fact that we have two applications essentially indistinct from each other in terms of what they're trying to claim? Are we going to grant two patents for the same invention? The obvious decision from all kinds of policy perspective is no, one's enough. Old cases decided, look, all of this problem is because the patent office is wholly inefficient and it doesn't grant patents on the day the application was filed. Probably not due simply to inefficiency. But you have to have some way to deal with the problem of somebody else filed an application that's still secret. And the way the act, both the new act and the prior one, dealt with it is saying, look, if there were another application that was filed before yours, and it eventually gets published, at which point it becomes public, a printed publication, or eventually turns into a patent, at which point it's patented or a printed, and a printed publication. That is prior art. As of when? As of the day it was filed. So that takes care of the later filed application. And it's, a, it's necessary secret prior art, but again, you have to keep in mind because you never know and you can't ever safely make the assumption that smart as you are, you're the only person who's working on this. Last substantive slide, just to show <laughs> how do you know. These are simple cases, but there are a lot of variations on it. Variations that you'll run into in your real business. Inventor showed a Rubik's Cube to a group of friends at a party. Big case, was that a public use? 
Well, under the totality of the circumstances, the Federal Circuit decided no. He was just explaining to them it was a private meeting, not a public meeting, et cetera. But how much do you have to change for it to become prior art? Suppose the demonstration is to someone you want to buy and make it for you. Suppose the demonstration is to an investor. How much do you have to change this before it moves from, whew, I'm safe, to where I just blew my patent? Second step, you've designed a really good machine, but you don't have unlimited resources. And besides, making this machine is going to require some expertise that you really don't have. So what do you do? You know what everybody does in these circumstances. You go find somebody who does have the expertise and you hire them to do it. Now you have a third party who has made your patented invention. So far, so good. But what do they do with the ones they've made? Do they sell them back to you? In which case is your invention now on sale? Do they go out and use them somewhere publicly? In which case your invention is in public use. Cases, particularly on getting the product back, have gone both ways. And a lot of it just seems to be dependent on, look, how smart was the lawyer, how Prenient was she when they wrote, she wrote the contract. Because to hire some, to order a hundred parts of this machine, examples of this machine to be sold back to me for a stated price puts it on sale. But if I wrote the contract, so I only hired the other person to conduct, quote, manufacturing services, that escaped the bar. How do you plan your business? to make use of third-party expertise when you need it, and frankly, you're not a massive company that can do it all in-house. I mentioned the PhD paper. Does it make a difference whether it's presented to your advisors, to a technical meeting, to a commercial group? Does it depend on what you hand it out? The answer is all of those. Again, and you're going to do this time and time again. You're not going to hide everything under a hat. What do you do to protect yourself at all on this? We'll, we'll get into it maybe next time. Again, next time. This is one of the things for which people use provisional patent applications. Before you let anybody go out and present any paper anywhere, you at least staple a cover sheet on that paper and send it off to the patent office and label it as a provisional patent application to try to get some protection that, gee, I've now filed an application. Grant proposals, I think I mentioned, the key seems to be, when do they become non-confidential? Is it okay when they get handed out for peer review? How big a peer review? You're in the medical field. You gotta do clinical trials. Are they secret? Or are they public uses? Does it matter whether it was the patentee conducting them or some third party? Cases, again, go both ways. Well, that's basically the end of non-answers on prior art and what's patentable subject matter. Next time, we're going to look at two things. Is what the patent claims obvious? Taking all of this prior art, would it be obvious for somebody who's not a dunce to do it? And how obvious does it have to be before that would bar a patent? And did you write a decent patent specification, or more properly, did your attorney? We'll look at that also next week. Again, thanks for coming.